last Saturday on January 12th, we saw the launch of a new political party, Liberty and Justice Party, led by Mr. Lennox Schumann. This program that comes here this evening is recorded, unlike usual programs when we go live, because Mr. Schumann leaves mm. tomorrow, Tuesday, for Canada, where he's training for professional purposes. At the launch, Mr. Schumann presented a number of persons and Two other of those persons will be with us, are with us this evening, Mr. Sean Dublin and Ms. Aaliyah Anthony. I welcome you all to this program Thank you very much, and extend to you congratulations and best wishes on the launch of the Liberty and Justice Party. Well, thank you, Chris. I'm. You know, I'm very happy that we are in this position. Um, and I do recall the last time we were here, we were just in the process of discussing it. I think it's very exciting. The, the vote in the National Assembly on December 21, 2018, obviously caused some kind of acceleration in the planning process, did it? Absolutely. When we when the vote was actually first and foremost i did not anticipate that the votes would have been held that way uh, or it would have gone that way because i thought that you know everything parliament being what parliament is and pretty much the divide in the house would have seen the government still standing and we had anticipated launching on the 9th of february and it obviously literally compressed our time from 18 months that we were looking at into a matter of a few. But all, all of that is still up in the air, right? Now, I, I, um, mm. Sean and Leah, your, your full participants in this discussion, and it's probably your first time, certainly first time on Plain Talk. Yes. Um, don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know Sean is, isn't. Um, but I just want to deal with some preliminary points with, with um, Mr. Schumann. You came out immediately after the vote and supported the idea of a vote in the National Assembly by members according to their personal preferences, or as we say, a conscience vote. Absolutely. And you know, I think before they even started in Parliament, I I am of a principal belief that Guyana needs to go into constituency-based representation, right, in Parliament. That would permit all of these members to vote with their conscience. Now, what happened on... Not necessarily. Not well, necessarily. Well, vote, vote to in represent... In the UK, you have, in the UK you, have, um, you have constituency system, but yet you have the whip. Right. And, and I, I, I... Attempt to direct people how to vote. I, I understand that. But guess what? At the end of the day, if your constituency say, look, this government is not good for us and you are our representative and we are asking that you vote this way, I think they should have that latitude, right? Mm -hmm. If the government is failing at some point, you have to be able to sit there and say, is this government really working? But I want to get to a, what I'd say a deeper issue that a lot of people seem to want to shy away from. What Mr. Sharandas did in Parliament is, in my view, presented an opening as to dire the direction that I think Parliament should go, whereby you vote based on what your constituency is asking you to do. That's one. Even if you're in a party list? Even if you're in a party list. Because if we do that, we are obviously going to have, you're going to have a lot more latitude. It's going to permit us to grow democratically. But I want to get to a different point that really, really did a lot of damage to Guyana. And I don't hear people talking about it publicly. Maybe it is tabooed in their circles. What Mr. Sharandas would have done is literally deepen the mistrust in Guyanese society. Now you've got the, I think- And you see I, that as positive? No, no, I said I, that is one of the harmful things to the nation. It has deepened the mistrust between 
our two um, larger ethnic groups. So, so it's good on the one you're saying it's good. It, it's good Be it's because people vote. It's he good. voted according to his conscience. Right, but the bad part is that it has actually deepened the racial divide in Guyana. It has harmed the nation in that sense. Does it have to be? When Prime Minister Nagamoto got up and said that was democracy at work, that could have been a healing process. When President Granger <coughs> said he would follow the Constitution, that could have been a healing process. It's not a vote, but a reaction to the vote by the politicians from one side of the divide to the other and how they manipulated it for their own purpose. Suddenly you heard that a, a majority is no longer a majority. And, and one person who has an American passport or a Canadian passport or a British passport is attacking another person for having a Canadian passport. That is hypocrisy. It's, you know, you know Lennox, and this is why I can never be in politics. <laughs> Because it's the hypocrisy of politicians. And I truly hope, Aliyah, Sean, Lennox, it's that you don't there. fall into that. There's a saying that power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. When people start clapping you and standing up, when you speak, and people opening doors and doing all sorts of things, you somehow start feeling you are different. And that is the slippery road in which we go. Well, I'm very glad that you brought that up, right? Um, what he also exposed a wound in our nation that has been there. And no one was willing to talk about it. The Constitution speaks about dual citizenship. And here you have 25 parliamentarians, 26 parliamentarians, who are it literally- It forbids dual citizenship. In, in terms of going into the National Assembly. Exactly. But here, they, here these, these people are breaking the supreme law of Guyana, and they are continuing to occupy the Legislative Assembly. And you are right. That is, to me, that is not worse you than know, hypocrisy. Th they're, they're going after Sharon Nas for treason. Th I think all 26 of them should be tried for treason. Listen, listen, <laughs> listen. <laughs> These people make a statutory declaration. Now they're swearing on oath. Do you know why Trump's campaign manager and his legal person are in, now in jail in the US? Just lying to the FBI. We make a statutory declaration. Our politicians are so shameless, devoid of decency, that they don't care. And you know why? Because the people who are going to vote for them, we are like sheep. And that's a tragedy. Alia, why did you decide to get involved in politics? <laughs> Tell us a little bit. Well, I believe that, I believe that you should be a core part in policy making. And the LGB, LJP um, presented me with that opportunity so I can be a part of whatever they have for the future. So, and I have a lot of ideas that I would like to get out there. So, give it, tell me a couple. Well, tell the viewers a couple. Sorry. <laughs> I believe that um, Guyana should be a nation that supports youths, and I believe that. Youths should not leave Guyana to become something. I believe that we should have avenues of opportunities um, for youths that support their passions. Um, yeah. What would you like to see your, your party in the National Assembly, whether with a majority or being able to influence decisions. Um, am I putting you on the spot? And if, if I am, just don't answer. What are the three most important things you'd like to see the parliament comprising every, all the political parties in the National Assembly doing for youths? Well, 
first of all, I think that they should look at education. I mean, especially in the hinterland areas, they should provide more education facilities, especially a tertiary education facility in the hinterland because there are many children in the hinterland that um, go up to secondary school and some of them want to go to to further their education, but there's no tertiary facilities in those areas for youth. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah, that's, that's it so far. Sean? Your role in politics? Um, well, Mr. Ram, it's been a while. Um, I would want to say, fortunate or unfortunate, I was a member of the People National Congress from 1997 up until 2015. Um, most people want to say that is when the party came into power. Yes. But, well, I in the recent past, because they were in power from 1960. Yes, yes, during that yes. period. Cause from 64 92, to 1992. Yeah, 92 yes. they lost the elections. But surprisingly, given my own conviction, and I'm um, Charandas had his own in terms of his conscience. I do also. <coughs> and after three months, and I saw the way how the government started to operate, I decided to back off. I realized that... So which, which political party did you support in elections in, 19, uh, in 2015? PNC. You supported Full out. Um, campaign, party work, from morning till next morning. Mm. From morning till next morning. But my whole take is that Guyana needs uh, a party that governs for all of Guyana. The time has come where it has to change. It has to change. And I believe that the Liberty and Justice Party, I can play a part and play a role to ensure that it can change. You say that you would like to see Guyana having a party that does that. That, um, that will embrace that, that avenue, all of yes. Guyana. Yes, with the policies, the, its plans, the, the, and programs. The more popular um, strategy that people seem to embrace, and particularly it's led to a large measure by David Hines, um, is this grand coalition. Um, as opposed to your idea that a single party. Um, what you is see, your position my on position a grand coalition? With the grand coalition, like I said at, in my speech at the launch, is that what has happened over time is that we're having this whole coming together of parties, but the, the genesis of the parties would affect the coalition. It did affect the coalition because we have to be fair, and I'm, I'm getting to an issue whereby we're talking about race. Where we see and perceive, and it is fact, that when someone like me, an afro is, right away, if I go into the, the booth to vote, they will say that's a PNC vote because of my ethnicity. That has to change. So when there is a coming together, the ideology the origin, the makeup of the parties are not changed. So when they come together and the friction between the parties, we have issues. That is why Mr. Charandas could have done what he did. My take is that we should have a party where the people can come together, all mm. ethnicity, plan programs and policies that will help the entire guy. And I'll give you one example. Aliyah should not have been saying tonight that we need tertiary education in the hinterlands. While on the coast, there's tertiary education, if we are planning for our peoples... And even on the coast, it's limited. What, you see? So, if we are planning for our peoples, if I can have a surgery at an hospital in Georgetown, I should be able to have a surgery in Letem. That is what I'm talking about, coalition of the peoples rather than the parties. But, but there are things like economies of scale. You don't, you don't expect in a, in a community of, say, a couple thousand to have the most state-of-the-art medical facility. 
I, I, I would suggest. Despite economy of scale, and if you're thinking Guyana is so rich with natural resources, we have oil coming and all that, economy of scale, in my view, would not take precedent over the health of my peoples. I, I understand what you're saying, but I, I think what is more important is not that that facility be in Lethem or in this area, but that there is access. That if someone is diagnosed, they must be immediately medevaced to a, a proper, adequate, and well-equipped facility. After all, we do as a country suffer badly from human resources. All the bright ones gone. Look one here. <laughs> well, he's home. He's home. <laughs> if, if I may interject there, I'm he's I'm home. I'm here, and I'm I'm sure you would have seen the kind of welcome I'm getting. <laughs> Yeah. It, it is a welcome home, Lennox Schumann, you know. Thank you for going back and wanting to come and contribute to Guyana. So we are obviously going to run you through the mill and put you through the guillotine and everything well, else. Can, can I point out part of the welcome you're getting from um, one of, uh, 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 I, I guess you would say, um, a brother? Um, well, I, do, I don't know that for sure. That is a that is just an accusation that ma that is made or no, but you, you, an you, implication you, made completely by Starbrook. That is not me at all, right? But so you, let's be you clear. have had this running problem with um, with certain people and and for example the, the the state media. And maybe now is the time for me to ask you. Now you know a few years ago, when the PNC made its submission to the Constitutional Reform Commission of following the Herdmanson. The PNC's commitment was complete divestment by the state in the media. What is, and, and, and I must congratulate you on your presentation, um, but I didn't see that issue addressed and I'm going to press you on a couple of issues. That one, party reform. You have political parties, including your own party, that is subject to not a single statutory or, or legal framework, none. Chris, let is me, that acceptable? L let me interject there. In terms of, I've spent a significant amount of time in Canada, no doubt. And I see the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation it is a taxpayer's, a taxpayer funded news um, operation in Canada. And the government has no hand in it. It is the taxpayer's money, the taxpayers control that. And if there's a slip, then it goes to the ombudsman's office, I think. And if, if you cannot get beyond that, then the average citizen or the government in themselves have a right to bring a legal challenge against that media. It is being funded. And I think something in that sort, because what it really does is that it provides equal access to information, to, to news and stuff like that, without any kind of um, leaning. Whereby you look at some of these outlets in Guyana, and all you need to do is read the first one or two lines, and you know which way they're leaning. I think what Guyana needs is something of that sort, where the state does not have a hand in it, it is the taxpayers that do, and that is controlled. The second point that I wanted to touch on, we started the process of getting a political party formed. And what we found out is that there is no, no guiding principles, there's no legal framework, there's no literature that says you want to form a party, you need to do this, 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 these are your legal obligations, these are your financial obligations, you are going to be audited on this. And to us, that is very, very worrying, right? All of these parties are popping up and you know, I, I've, I've heard this kind of adage that it's, it's party time, <laughs> which I, I can see why they're, why they're thinking of it that way. They're taking it as a joke, but a party is a serious matter. You're dealing with the nation's interest, and you are correct. We do need party legislation. The second thing that I want to pose there, and I said it this morning when, uh, when I had this discussion with Gordon Mosley about, you know, one of the highlights on the media was that Schumann not willing to disclose financiers for party. I don't see anyone pressing the PNC. 
I don't see anyone pressing the PPP, but... But, 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 you're, but you're saying you will be different. Absolutely. Certainly. We Certainly. intend on being transparent in how we get that. And we are actually going to drive, um, what I should say, campaign financing legislation in Parliament because I think it is important that people know who is funding which party. Why don't you set that example from now? Well, we are. We are going to do that. But I want to be very, very cautious in that. Our donors, some of them have been targeted. Why? We should not be living in an environment where you fear giving someone money. Why? Because of their political affiliation. But, I think but the if, you believe, about if that. you believe in accountability and transparency, you cannot, you cannot have your cake and eat it. You can't say to people, look, we're going to take your money. Are we not going to disclose? That's fundamentally anti-accountability. A, a party that, that claims, and I'm sure it has good reasons for claiming, that it's going to be different, is going to say, look, we will not accept money from you anonymously. We don't want anonymous donations. We are, our books are going to be open. We are prepared, we are prepared to say, for example, that we will accept no, de no, do no, no donation above a certain figure. And I would support that. There is, one, there is one caveat, right? The Constitution speaks about freedom to associate and to be politically aligned and all that stuff. But let's say the head, the chair of the TSC says, look, you know what, education reform, I like what you guys have done, and I am going to give you Ten million dollars, or let's say, let's say we cap it to ten million, and they come out and they say, "Look, TSC chairperson donated ten million dollars to LJP." Right off the bat, we get them in trouble because we know that at the end of the day, people are going to look at that's look at that as an it. institution. That's why you limit it. Right, but we don't mind the limit. I'm just using it as an example, right? So right away, right off the bat, someone is going to come out and say, "Look at this, the chairman for the TSC is supporting." this party so they must be aligned and all those things without recognizing that person's individual well, I, freedom. I think, I think you, well, I, I, there is no freedom without some form of regulation. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you, Lee, what do you think about your party leader who is Canadian resident, Canadian national um, citizen, um, agreeing to give up his citizenship? I think it's a very noble thing to do. And what would you say about um, about all the other people in in the in your own party? Is that now going to be an absolute standard that no one will be on our list who has dual citizenship? Is that a, is that what's going to happen? And um, what about the, the, the other parties, the EBPC and the APNU plus AFC? Don't be afraid to answer. <laughs> You're not scared, are you? Yeah, uh, yeah, a bit. That's a very tough one. What about you? Um, for me, uh, we, we in our intention, rather, is to to set the pace, so to speak, when it comes to having a party that is transparent, having a party that is willing to follow uh, the but rules. But we just said, in terms of campaign financing, your your, your party leader has been criticised because yes. he said he's not he's not giving out information. It's out of context. That was out of context. That he's not giving out information on donations because we will we will take monies from people, and their names would be there in our books. It's not that we're taking funds anonymous from anyone. I don't mm -hmm. know where the media got that from. No, but, but disclosure. You, so you think, you think, they, they all know where the money comes from. The PPP does the same thing. The APNU does the same thing. They got a 50 million plus a 50 million dollars. They know where it came from. We all know where it came from. Chris that well, doesn't mean it, it, it's transparent. That doesn't mean it's accountability. Chris, uh, well, did, did, I'm, sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you want to give us $50 million? Because we'll take it and we'll put your name on the books. I'm sorry. I don't, <laughs> I don't have anything like that. I, 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 I am, an, I am a, 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 a 
rabid advocate for campaign finance. Well, we, we intend to set the pace, basically, as I said, for campaign financing, for following the Constitution, so if the Constitution, as it's rightly saying, do a citizen cannot be a part of the Parliament, we are following that. So our candidates will be screened, questions will be asked before they're put up on our list. That's, that's what we do from day one. And, and permit me to correct something. It is not that we are not going to disclose it. But obviously, we have to deal with confidentiality issues with our donors. And, I, and I, I understand that. I understand, that. I understand that they all say that. And just as we have that opportunity to maybe work out the language in that sense, maybe just list and say our donors are these people without listing the quantum and just list a, a lump sum as to what the quantum is for all the donations. There are formulations that literally could work and we have to sit down and take a look at it, how we could literally deal with addressing some of these issues. You know, one of the, one of the things that runs through the presentation you made is that this will be a different party. It's not going to be one with the old ideologies. Um, it will foster democracy. Democracy isn't fostered by one or two people financing, like, like the Koch brothers in the United States of America, for example. Financing and sub, rather than, in fact, they subvert democracy. So how do you, this the creating a new political beginning? I know the challenge. If you're fighting someone who is operating on a different set of rules. Right. But how do you develop this movement that attracts people who say, you know what? These people are really very serious. How do you do it? I think our manifesto would would speak to most of the things that you're asking about, but I want to go back to the Koch brothers situation. I think there was a Supreme Court ruling that Citizens United, the, right, right, that the um, is a freedom that, of expression that by thing. limiting campaign financing, you're limiting one's ability to speak, and it was it was a tragedy in my view for the people who are suffering in the U.S., the underprivileged, and so on and so forth, because it simply means that one person could bankroll an entire party Absolutely. and drown out everyone else. But it, once again, I am making this commitment very, very firm that we are, we are not dodging the issue. We simply have not figured out that formulation as yet. And maybe, Chris, we just don't want you to know that we have one dollar in our account, <laughs> right? We have to be very careful as to what the public image is also. but. We, for us, a new political beginning speaks to what you see in front of us. And I know there is, we only have three chairs. Had we had four or five or six, we could have had all six, all six of, of Guyana's ethnicities represented here. We have to be very clear on that. The new political beginning for Guyana is one that speaks about unity. We've, we've literally played identity politics for so long that we have to start reprogramming people's minds to understand what unity is. We have but to, does, we have it to begin, does it begin um, with repro reprogramming our own minds? First, you, you first have to change yourself before you can change anybody. I think being, we here, have. I think being here <laughs> speaks to me. my I mean, mind's already renewed in that sense. Plain talk is obviously flattered. <laughs> In that sense. <laughs> no, plain dog is obviously flat. We, we, don't de we don't deserve such a thing. <laughs> now, I want to raise a, 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 another issue. You have tried to shed yourself of any suggestion that you are an ethnically tied party. Um, though you read through your speech, and you do see at times it's, um, it comes out the value of all indigenous languages giving equal status to all ten languages of Guyana, with the assumption that people know 
what the other nine are. Um, where do you think your party will draw the core of its strength? Let me touch on the language component first. I think Article 149G of the Constitution speaks about the rights of indigenous peoples. Oh, yes. Right? And all we've done there is literally restated Article 149G in a different form. It means that we are going to strive to ensure that the Constitution of Guyana is respected. I think Sean would have mentioned that we intend on complying fully with the laws and the Constitution being the supreme law. Like I said, it's simply restated in a different form in there. I think there's another one that speaks about respecting the rights of indigenous peoples. Obviously, the Constitution already states that, it, but it's just restated in there in a different form. Our base supporters, we are anticipating it, it, it would be a very, very strong component of the 68% of youths in Guyana. And we know that some of these might have been brainwashed and need to be reprogrammed in that sense. But 68% of youths, that is the future of Guyana. And we intend on tapping into that as much as we can. I think if you read through the speech also, it speaks about um, recycled politics <laughs> and recycled politicians to a certain extent. If you look at both parties, they have people there with old ideologies. I mean, take Carl Greenwich, for example. He's a throwback from Barnham days. Obviously, he brings Barnham um, ideology into the party, injects it, and I think even the president himself right, for, was from there. If you look back at the, at the PPP, you've got some old stalwarts who were around when Jagan was there. We have to understand that those ideologies would not have evolved. They're simply there, and yes, they've got a vision, and they're going to do whatever they can. And they're not in a politics of progress. They're in a pol in trapped in kind of a political... But are you suggesting that everything that went before is bad? No, no. Progress may simply means change? No, 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 don't get me wrong. B both parties would have done a significant amount for Guyana. But what I'm saying is that they have not provided the kind of progressive thinking and progressive movement for Guyana. When you think of it, the PPP's mantra right now that they are putting out to the public is that if you don't f vote for us, these guys are going to be in there. And those guys are saying, if you don't vote for us, those guys are going to be in there. Compared to saying, guess what? Vote for us because our vision for Guyana is something different. So basically, they're not, they're not in it for Guyana. They're simply in it to deny the next party getting into power. And I think that that mental fix is wrong. Isn't that, uh, broadly, they, they don't know no one quibble what you said, but surely the, the Guyanese voter, the Guyanese electorate, understands that, look, the APNU AFC can no longer come and say, we'll do this in the first 100 days. <laughs> They'll have to say <laughs> what you did <laughs> and what you didn't do. Right. You'll be Certainly. judged on your record. Now, Certainly. you have an ideal opportunity. You can say what you will do. Yes. You have no, uh, uh, and this is not to be disparaged, you have no record sure. um, to go on. Um, the only real public figure in all of this to so, uh, has been yourself. Um, now, you have this name, Liberty <laughs> and Justice. Um, what? This, these two terms, what is it that they mean and are like, are, and convey to the electorate? Liberty and justice. We got justice for all. <laughs> you already have justice. Sean, you want, me to, you want me to take this? Yeah. Sean, you got to come. <laughs> <laughs> come, Aliyah, you justice. can. All right, she, while, while she's having a drink, l let, me, let me take the lead on this, right? When we started off, we wanted to be the liberal and justice because our values are liberal. We believe in equality of the mass. Everyone is afforded equal opportunity, equal access, equal, 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 right? There's nothing liberal well, about that. Well, that's a fundamental, um, that's well, natural justice and fundamental human rights. But if you look at it, it is actually perfectly in line with liberal values. If you were to look at the conservative um, approach, it would be vastly different. Equality in that sense speaks about liberalism. 
And we it was actually going to be Liberal and Justice Party, but then someone said there's already a Justice for All party and you may be confusing people when you go in that direction who may have not garnered enough votes to move themselves anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So we sat there and then there was a discussion that liberal and justice could mean that you are liberal with justice, which obviously that is not what we're trying to convey to the people. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is to ensure that the structures are liberating to the people. And that is why we came up with liberty, right? How do we capture our liberal values and ensure that the people understand that we are trying to liberate them? If you read through our, mani our, our presentation on, on Saturday night, it also speaks about the emancipation of youth. To me, that is ver very, very liberating in how we present these things. Justice, we've got social justice, e economic justice, political justice, legal justice. You could think of a lot of things in the context of justice. Had we had political justice, I think, and maybe just legal justice, those 26 parliamentarians would have been out. And you would have had, you know, obviously, you would have had um, Minister Henry out, Minister Vaughan Lawrence out, um, Minister Keith Scott out, uh, former Minister Barry Ramsaran out. You would have had all of these people out because the political justice You would are have certain that those people have dual, dual citizenship. No, no, I'm not saying in dual citizenship um, context, but they have offended the nation. You look at what um, Barry Ramsaran, Dr. Ramsaran would have done when he threatened to slap a women's rights activist. That is, that is arguably one of the most underrepresented, disenfranchised groups in Guyana. And you have a minister of state, a correction, a minister of the government threatening to slap someone in that, in that sense. To me, political justice and social justice would have dealt with that and seen him go. And I, and I think he's still sitting in parliament today under, this, under this, these guys. The next thing is you've got Keith Scott standing up in parliament and calling another marginalized group, the indigenous peoples of Guyana, greedy. And he continues to sit in parliament. You've got Miss Pagwali, if I were to put it that way. I don't mean to berate it, but that is how these things come across. There is no political justice. There is no social justice. And you've got a whole lot of people who are being denied legal justice. What we want people to understand is that we intend on liberating them from these literal um, political divides, racial divides. Liberate them from that. Put the structures in place that, is going, that will see those things addressed. And obviously, the judicial system would be working in the people's interests and not necessarily in the government's interests. Well, we don't have a Judicial Service Commission. We have this constitutional body called the Judicial Service Commission. And President Granger can't get around to appointing one as yet. Um, in terms of coalition politics, what would I entice you if one of the juggernauts, the behemoths, was to say, come on board with us and we'll help you promote your program. What would be your response? What would you want your party to, to respond to that? I, uh, I the PPP or the APNU um, were to say to the Liberty and Justice Party. Well, I don't think we would agree to, because what our visions for Guyana, I don't think we would want to come together to be under somebody to get in power. We want to do it the right way. So that's my take in it. Um, from the outset, um, um, when I would want to say anything to Guyana, I speak from my conviction, and if I'm saying that throughout the years, because of the formation of the parties and people identifying them with an ethnicity, um, it would be difficult for us to collate with them in, on that basis, and we rather to, to meet with the people and collate with the people, share our vision with them, and it's my conviction that Guyana will, will listen. But or, But let me put another spin on it. If they want to come and have that discussion with us, we're we're in we're obviously open to dialogue in what is going to move Guyana. So forward. you're not ruling it out. Hold on, let me finish. 
we're, we're, uh, we're in dialogue, we're open to dialogue to move Guyana forward. And if they want to come and have that discussion with us, then we'll say, all right, well, you know what? You want to have this, let's see how honest you are about moving Guyana forward with your formula. We want the presidency, we want the prime ministership, we want to be obviously the um, minister of state, and we're going to take the heavy portfolio. And you could take whatever else, and we are going to control the agenda to a certain point, and then after that, we could give it to you. But basically, we want the top end of the executive. So you're saying that you will have, you, you will not Chris, oppose the coalition? Chris, because I know these guys will never agree to it, right? They, no one no, is no, going... No, no, but because, no. because you're a new party, you're acting from principle. <laughs> absolutely, yes, absolutely. And this is why I'm saying these things. I know that they would never, ever go there because what we intend so on doing why, is why driving... So why can't you say, no, problem. we won't? Well, hold on a sec. The, ne the next thing is that we are going to obviously communicate to them is if you are serious about moving Guyana forward, instead of us joining forces like that, why don't you come and join us? We are, open, we are still open our doors to members, so all of you could maybe start leaving your party and coming to be part of us. We're, we're not going to say no to that. I, I'm not getting a <laughs> clear answer whether you're emphatic that you will not. Because I think you've said, you're on record as having said that. We are not. Just, we're not. We're not. We're not. You're not what? We're, we're not in, we're not open to a coalition. But we welcome them as members. And you, you also, it appears um, that the, it is not in your party's interest to work with other smaller parties at this stage, including the um, the a new <laughs> and united Ghana. What, what was Nog is uh, is now Anog. Um, our members and our executive, we've been very clear on how we want to move forward. I think there are a lot of politicians who come with uh, dogmas. And it is important that we don't start off in that light. A lot of politicians come with baggage. And remember we talked about not dealing with recycled politics and recycled politicians in this sense. We intend on tapping into the resources that are there. And if they want to pro provide themselves as resource persons, we'd be more than happy to sit down and have that dialogue with them. But I think their initial thoughts were that we would go and fold ourselves under them. Our constitution actually speaks about the uh, about uh, non-coalescing, and it would be unfair of us to adopt a document and turn right around and betray the very essence of that document. So, in in light of that, we have to be very clear: if they want to come and join us, if anyone wants to come and join us, we are open to that. One of the big problems we have in our society and let's put aside the political problems for now is this immense disparity and gap between those who have and those who don't have what kind of programs and I, I, I didn't see a strong mm -hmm. element and this is not I know you were, as you said, you had to accelerate. What kind of philosophy, if you don't want to use the word ideology, or economic model, is the Liberty and Justice Party going to be promoting? There are three components, and I think a uh, tri sectoral economy is probably the easiest way to deal with it. We deal with what the government can do. And the government's obligation to fill all of those positions. We know that education, healthcare, and infrastructure are heavy. And we could look at what the government's commitments are and see how we could literally create the avenues for employment in those core sectors. The second component is obviously looking at the PPP, uh, public-private partnership and seeing how we can utilize that partnership with the public to create employment. How does that deal with this, this serious 
disparity in income and wealth, you're still talking about a model where you have the employer um, and the employed, the wage earner, and, and those who um, provide employment, maybe. But in a very um, asymmet symmetrical relationship. Well, one of our big things, literally, is how do we... Let's take, <clears throat> take an example, um, like sugar, the sugar industry, right? We know, and it is, it, maybe it's time that these sugar workers understand and that they know what the reality on the ground was. All they would have done was being provided handouts to keep them as dependents. So you, had, saw, had you they, saw maintaining they, the sugar estates open as handouts? I saw that as trapping people into a state of dependence in perpetuity. And what I was getting at is had these political entities been interested in looking out for the livelihood of these people while supporting the economy and obviously addressing the income gap in that sense, instead of having 7,000 people who are out of work, why not create 7,000 people who are landowners provide the environment that supports them to become entrepreneurs and support their businesses. And instead of having land that is literally sitting idle, you've got people who are unemployed. You could have had 7,000 landowners who are supporting the economy while growing their, their family, growing their family's wealth, and doing a whole host of things. And that is only one sector. We've had, we've had issues where the mining sector has come under attack. We've had the forest sector where we literally give. We are giving Guyana away. We're giving all of our raw materials away. We're giving bauxite away. There is no reason why we cannot open a smelting plant. There is no reason why we cannot open um, other industries that would see us not do that. I bet when crude starts to flow, we are simply going to give that away too, right? Instead of looking at how we could bring that and utilize it for Guyana's interest. One of the serious issues, we, we talked briefly about um, the indigenous community. One of the serious issues um, affecting the Amerindian communities, and it came to the fore when we had some land rights commission um, is this question of land rights for the indigenous people. Land rights that recognize the communal nature of their ownership. That recognize that, look, you don't rear animals in, in quarter acre. That you are talking about a different model. Why is why was your um, speech, your launch speech, silent on this question it of was land rights? It was not silent at all. It says respect the rights of yes. indigenous peoples. It, it didn't say it didn't use the word land at all. But it did not use land. People have a multitude of rights, and indigenous peoples, I think, land rights. It is in. It is implied in the statement in itself. Well, in that case, how do you propose, how does the LJP propose dealing with land rights for the indigenous people? Well, let's look at history. In 1814, when the Dutch gave Guyana to the Brits, land rights was one of the things. Respect the indigenous people's land rights and way of living. And the Brits said, OK. When, they, when the Brits, when Guyana gained independence, I think the Land Commission was set up to address those same land rights, which was, I think, one of the conditions of independence. And since independence, there hasn't been the kind of movement on addressing those very rights that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And what we intend on doing is to ensure that those things are obviously addressed with urgency, obviously with, within the context of the law. And... I think there is one of the articles, every time we would have had this discussion with GGMC, oh, well, we can't do anything about it. They cite one court case, and 
I don't know if they're scared or if they feel if they have other vested interests in it or stuff like that. But we know that both sides of the house, it is not in their interest to have those things settled with finality because it is a tool that they are going to continuously use for indigenous peoples and say, oh, we are going to address your land rights. We are going to address your land rights. So it becomes this, this way of entrapping them again, just as they did with the sugar workers. They are entrapping indigenous peoples and giving them this sense of false hope that they are actually going to look after those things, which they never really do. If you look at stats bar during the Barnham era, they titled 28 communities, I think, during the PPP era, it was, mm -hmm. uh, it was significantly less. And during this time, it is non-existent. In fact, what we've seen under this administration is a retraction where they gazetted um, ANI as an NDC. That is a retraction of rights. Um, so basically, if we were to look at history and the direction that the state is going, before long, you're going to see that the land rights is a non-issue because there is no rights or there are no rights. What we intend on doing is the, taking the same constitutional obligation under Article 149G, and there are some others that we could use, and ensure that they are, ap uh, that they are applied in that sense. And literally with us in Parliament now, people don't want to talk about constitutional reform. Well, guess what? That is now on the table. They well, don't want to talk about addressing indigenous land rights, addressing how do we deal with ethnic chauvinism and all of these things. Those things are on the table. How do, how do we deal with national unity? When, you, um, when you've got a ministry of social cohesion that is being used as a partisan political machine, that means that you have no serious intent on addressing the problem. So all of those things we intend on addressing all of those, and I think that if our policies are shaped appropriately, the ministry of social cohesion becomes literally a joke in the textbooks of history, because that is what I think of the ministry currently. If you have a say, and, and when, Chris, not if, when. If you have a say, <laughs> when you have a say, yes, on constitutional reform, since you're so emphatic, um, what are the major changes you will regard as absolute non-negotiable and um, imperative for me uh given our political landscape and all the alleged corruption that people talk about throughout the years the executive presidency we would want to do away with that and that's non-negotiable that would be and replaced by what the is we will have a presidency um, for some people, we would suggest, well, it's not final in terms of our position, where we have a ceremonial president, and the prime minister is the one who will conduct the business. But the idea behind that is so that if a president would have been involved in any corruption, he can be impeached. The, co the present constitution provides for impeachment of a president. But, but I, I'm saying it in this context that the way how it is set up, the president has the power to wield. And okay. In our context, so it's, so it's one of the one of the changes um, is executive would be the, the abolition of the executive, executive president. presidency. What of a few others? Non-negotiable. Um, the issue of dual citizenship, in terms of constitutional reform, is that given the fact that our leader is coming back from Canada to serve his country and he has to now give up his citizenship. It shows that persons with dual citizenship has a lot to offer to Guyana. So our take is that while you might come back and have the expertise over those persons who are here, is not to come to lord over them. But but the, the opportunity must be given to persons with dual citizenship to, to play a part is it to make process. is it to make laws to make laws for this country even though they may not be bound by those same laws no you see the context is important it's not to say that that's why i'm putting have, it in context yes it's not for say that you will have dual citizenship just for sake of dual citizenship 
it means that you could be able to come and participate in the process to make laws not just to make laws in the sense of but making that's, laws. that's the main function of the national assembly sir but in, in terms of pro providing that expertise for policy making you can provide expertise without being mr schumer was providing expertise for a long time without being a member of the national assembly I believe your vote will be, will be counted when you're in the National Assembly as providing laws outside of it. So. Chris, let's look at this from a, from a family perspective. And we all know my, my position, my situation, right? My wife is a Canadian, our kids are Canadian, and they currently are in Canada, at least up until our children are done their exam and they were up there while I was doing training and all that stuff. That aside, <clears throat> if and I have to go through this process, it's very real, right? I give up my Canadian citizenship, I have to apply for a visa. If a visa is denied, then what becomes of my family? We have to look at things realistically. I don't, and I- You don't have to be in parliament. No, but I've, I've made this- You chose to do I've it. I've made this very clear. Absolutely. You choose to do it. Absolutely. So I, you can't choose to do it and send, you can't I have, get, but I don't want, I, I, I don't want to get, what we, we're talking about is what are some of the imperatives. Right. So you're saying, you would put among the leading changes to the Constitution is to have persons who, by any act, have sworn allegiance to a foreign state to come and make laws for this country. What, what else would you suggest? Well, if the first was I tell the executive presidency, then we talk about the dual citizenship so that we can tap into the diaspora in a real sense of being part of the political uh, fray, so to speak. Um, I think, I think we have to think about that in terms okay. of let, let, sure. let, me, let me interject here. I think what we need to do is de deal with the constituency-based representation. I think that is something that needs to be addressed with urgency. Um, next thing is we have- But we have you know we had that before. Yes. And you know it, <laughs> it had changed. its oh, it's no it, it had its own in inequities. We saw it in Trinidad recently where COP had twenty two percent of the votes and not a single seat in the National Assembly. We we are going to obviously we don't have that formula finely tuned, but we do have an opportunity to start that discussion. Right? Next thing we've got a series of commissions that literally clogs the system up. Let's let's take teachers, for example, and I, I don't mean to sound like I'm picking on TSC, but it applies, <laughs> it applies so realistically in the geography of Guyana, right? And I say this because I experienced it in my community. There, were, there are positions open for teachers in our community. And in order to fill those positions, it has to be advertised, it has to go through TSC, and then eventually someone's going to bid on it that potentially displaces a person from our community in that mm -hmm. sense. If the ministry was sensible enough, they would say, TSC, thank you, you've done a fantastic job, you've represented history well, but what we want to do is to have a system where we are going to tap into the locals before we tap into others. I, there, are, there are a few, but I was advised so that we, we're tight on time. You would, you would get rid of the Teaching Service Commission? There are a whole series of, of commissions, Which commissions that you, you would could get rid of? look at tribunals. Um, we could deal with the, with the TSC. We could deal with the Police Service Commission. I think we could look at a different so who will make, who Board will of Trustees. These, who will make these appointments? It's just another name, though, isn't it, it Leonard? But a tribunal in itself actually would have the would be able to um, wield a legal hammer, whereby yeah. a commission does not. All they do is make a representation to Parliament. I think you have to empower people to do things. Um, just bear in mind that lots of these commissions were creatures of a constitutional reform process, and perhaps what we in Guyana need to do is to probably identify what are our problems, what are the barriers that inhibit our development, and then sit down and work them out rather than go through every few years, you have a constitutional reform process that simply returns the previous, uh, to the status quo. Right. Mr. Lennox Schumann, Mr. Sean Dublin, and Ms. Aaliyah 
Anthony, thank you so much for appearing in Plain Dog. Once again, congratulations and best wishes um, to, to you and your party. We wish you, Plain Dog wishes you well, wishes you success. Um, the more, the merrier. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris, and I look forward to when we're going to be here next month. All the time, all the time. <laughs> Operators and viewers, thank you. Good night, and re recall, as I said, this was a recorded program. Have a good week. Chris, I'm going to shake your hand. I know it's not automatic.